So those first three questions of, of when, well, now, there's a clear answer to the question when. It's now. now is a unique point, that unique center point of the, this infinite span of past and future and has a unique nature. It is exactly what it is. We can believe otherwise, doesn't, doesn't affect it. The difference, that distinction, that, that incoherence between what we see or what we believe and what is, that makes a difference. But what is, is, including that lack of full presence or coherence within us and our, between us and our environment. So, and then the, the, the uh, where. Yes, we're, we're, you're centered in you. I'm centered in me. The earth is centered in the earth. The sun is centered in the sun. The question, for example, of, well, is, are we living, the ancient question of, are, are we living in a geocentric world? Well, it, our earthly life certainly is geocentric. It's, you know, we don't live on the sun. It's not the center of our world. It, it, it does move across the sky from our perspective. And, and relativity, which Einstein's concept really is, is to me, a, a model of perception. Re relativity is how we perceive. You perceive from your perspective and I perceive from mine. We perceive the, the heavens and the sun from the earthly perspective. And in fact, when we make a space shot and send up a rocket, all the mathematics that have to be used are not the C Copernican revolution uh, uh, heliocentric mathematics. You wouldn't get the rocket off the earth. You have to be geocentric to get it up into the heavens. And then when you're out in the, you know, in the solar system, you can go to a heliocentric model or cent centered on whichever planetary body that you're orbiting. So, so it's relative. There is relativity. But that's in how we perceive things. That's our perspective of where we are. And, and then who we are, the third question, the identification. And, and it's, it's not only who we are, but who are you and, and who is that? Or what, it's kind of a what question, but it's really a who because everything, again, at the base is consciousness. So everything is angelic in its nature, an angel being the, defined as a, a thought of God. If consciousness is the fundamental nature of all existence, and we know it's completely coherent in that every, uh, every proton is exactly, precisely has the same nature. It's a fractal uh, presence of the same exact mass, the same exact characteristics as every other proton, except they have, they have, can have different energy, they have different uh, a different environment, a different where, a different, you know, a, a different when from each moment to another. So each one is completely unique in its history and its, in its presence and its relationship with the universe and relationship with each other. And yet they're identical in their, in their nature. This is the, the nature of angelic, the angelic realm, the perfection of how can it be the same here and every other part of the universe? Well, every, every proton for example, within that proton, there's the tiny, tiny fractal, the smallest presence of space, time, and energy that we can, uh, can we begin to measure. Uh, we can theori theorize beyond, but, but the measures go to the Planck length, the Planck dimension of space, the Planck time, the Planck energy. And so it's, we can think of a little dodecahedron, a little 20-sided, uh, sorry, 12-sided, 12, 12 20-pointed, uh, the, the, the fifth of five uh, platonic solids, the, the, the most uh, advanced platonic solid, which interestingly, that resonance we're gonna see over and over. It, in a fractal universe, we see the same patterns appearing at every scale. And so at the uh, atomic nucleus scale, we have in, in palladium, a nucleus that, that is represented in, in, in low energy atomic physics by the, the, uh, uh, the Moon model. Professor Moon was on, on, the, on the, the group, part of the group of physicists, uh, the Manhattan Project that, that unfortunately developed a, uh, a nasty way to, to, use <laughs> to use energy for destructive purposes. But imagine that the constructive 
purpose of energy within you, within your spirit body, as measured by the one measurement that's ever, one research project that's ever been done to measure the mass of the soul, is over 20 grams of mass in the human soul that left instantaneously at the moment of death, and, and a trail that follows that over a period of an hour or two. That amount of mass is actually many times greater, like 10, 20 times greater than the amount of mass released into energy at Hiroshima with that bomb that Professor Moon and the others developed to release energy from matter. So the amount of energy in you, not just your biological body, that's a whole bunch more, but, but that's, not, that's not the part that has the leverage to be able to change the universe and co-create. It's the soul that's made out of these spirit minerals, I call them, the, the condensates of the transition metals in a non-metallic state, in a state that's a condensate, which means it's super conducting, super fluid. And again, this is the basis, the foundation of, of consciousness, of thought. It's the, it's the presence of matter that's only five-ninths, and it can change, but five-ninths is the typical uh, ratio of the mass that's present here now. So almost half, four-ninths, is either somewhere else and or some other time and or perhaps completely non-local with the divine non-local, the, the absolute non-local, I call it. So that's how we're able to remember. That's how we're able to think of the future or receive a vision, a true vision, a revelation of the, of the future. So uh, this brings us to the fourth fundamental question of why. When, when we know who we are, and, and we identify, we name all these other things, we, we make them things. We know in physics there isn't a thing until there is an observer. The quantum doesn't quantize, the waveform doesn't collapse into a thingness, into a presence of here, now, a who, an angelic who, until there's an observer, until there's an interaction. Just like in, in, in holography and the, the hol holographic concept in physics of the universe is one of the leading models that this a, a three-dimensional space can be in physics like a hologram which is a two-dimensional image creates a three-dimensional perception so we may be perceiving this three-dimensional space that's actually a, a three-dimensional image project, projected from a two-dimensional surface like the surface of the brain for example, the surface of the divine brain, whatever that is, wherever that is. If this is an epiphenomenon of the divine consciousness, then yes, we can say to the biologists that our consciousness is an epiphenomenon of the brain, which is an epiphenomenon of the divine brain. And still, to understand the why and how that works, we have to understand that there is this immortal spirit body that's the part of the brain that makes it conscious. Because the brain is not conscious when the brain is flatlined, and when the heart stops and the brain goes flatlined, and yet there's people who've had out-of-body experiences and perceived from the corner of the room their, their dead body. They didn't say, that's me. They said, oh, that poor person. They must have had a heart attack. And only when they came back in the body, they realized in retrospect, being able to see the past, that image in their mind of the past, that, oh, that must have been me. Well, we identify with the body because we're in it. Once we're out of it, I'm here, it's now, that's over there. That's not me, obviously. And yet it was me a moment ago. Or I, I may have identified with it because it's my body. So we've had people have come back with true experiences when the brain was flatlined. They didn't experience it through the brain. The brain is like an antenna, it's like a TV set. You know, we can see the program through the TV set, but we could see the program through another TV set or another, the, the, the waves are in the air. We have another antenna, another way of showing that image. We can see it without the TV set. The, the, the picture, the, the consciousness isn't in the TV set by itself, that's just a dead thing. But when we plug it in and tune it into the station, it becomes an antenna, it's, it's a resonance phenomenon. And so the, the, 
the best model, best current model of consciousness in terms of the brain is that the, is called the ORC OR model for orchestrated objective reduction, which is as complex as it sounds, but it's basically saying the waveform of all that is that's just just God's thought doesn't become a thing until there's an orchestration of well how I see it is like in a in a in a uh, hologram, you don't create a hologram unless you have two lasers that cross. One laser is the coherence of the divine thought. We see that coherence, as I say, in the coherence of one proton with another proton with every other proton. And that inside, as I was beginning to say, inside each of those protons is exactly, we calculate how many Planck units of energy. Oh, there's exactly enough that each one of those can be, be the antenna, the representative of a specific proton in the universe, in the, in the, within the Hubble sphere of the sphere of the universe that we have contact with, that we can see, that we can measure. So everything is here now, and yet here now has a uniqueness to it. And this is how the divine creation works, that everything is unique. Everything has a history, and that history is meaningful, just like uh, uh, say an electron has been, uh, it was part of a particular uh, compound and now it, it, it ionizes off of that compound, it has a certain energy, so it's like on a certain radio station, certain frequency, but that frequency is also modulated. This is at a level of subtlety that we cannot measure with our three-dimensional uh, equipment scientific equipment at this time, but we can measure the biological response that varies according to the source. And so it's like different radio station, it might be the same station, but now the news is on before it was a song, and so that's a different information signal. So informational signals are become very, uh, a key part of medicine, of healing. So back to the fourth question of why, this is the mind. The mind is actually a linear, like, like our navigation through time, it's a linear structure. We chain one image or one word or one concept, one identification together with another and we make a sentence out of words. Uh, after we've broken down this three-dimensional, four-dimensional space-time world perception into chunks to say, oh, that's a chair. You know, I could also say, oh, that's, that part of the chair is wood. Oh, that part we'll call the leg. Oh, and there's the foot. And it, you know, we can, it's, it's not only one layer, it's multi-layered and, and in, in integrated. Uh, so there's, there each concept like that chair has, is, is connected to wood and connected to cloth and connected to the concept of gravity and it has weight and mass and it sits on the floor. It doesn't float up in the air. So it's a network, it's a web, like a worldwide web of ideas and identities and words in our mind, but we, to think, we string them into linear strings, just like when we take in food, it has all these nutrients in, but they're built into, you know, a vegetable or a fruit or a meat or it's this oil and it has a complexity to it. We digest it, we take it apart into pieces, like those pieces of the world we take apart into concepts or words, and then what do we do? We string them back together and make our own structure of DNA as a linear structure, the proteins are a linear structure, enzymes and structural proteins. Uh, so that's as above, so below, that the, that the thought world works in parallel and harmony uh, in, in a fractal relationship with the physical body. So we're trying to figure out why, well, how do things work? Why is it that way? What's going on? And beyond that, the next question is how? How shall I respond to this thing that I, this, this here, now, me, and it, how do I want to change it? Because I do have this consciousness of myself, which is this linear function, like another laser. We've created a laser of thought, which now is a cross laser with crossing the divine universal laser of, of existence, of creation, that creates the moment of now, recreates it in every moment, we, we cooperate that with that, we dance with that, we coordinate with that. 
And so that's what creates the quantum in, in quantum physics. It creates that orchestrated object reduction of the orco r model of consciousness that says the only place that could find enough bits of data storage to account for human memory is inside these scrolls in the brain, in, this, in our cells, in all our cells, and outside our cells, the, the, the tubules, the microtubules that are the skeleton, the cytoskeleton of our cells and the, the skeleton of our connective tissue, which is the home that every cell lives in. Did you know that when we use anesthetics, uh, general anesthetic, when you go unconscious, what's happening is the, that those anesthetics go into the cell membrane and they disrupt the connection of the microtubules to the cell membrane. So the shape of the cell actually changes. It loses its memory of its shape. And we lose our memory of, you know, many times people come back from general anesthesia and have lost memories. They've lost sometimes parts of the personality. They don't come back because the cell doesn't necessarily come back to its original shape and structure and form, which is the shape of the antenna. When you change the shape of the antenna, you might pick up a different station or you might lose the, the, the tuning that you had to that particular station in space and time, past, present, future. So uh, the stronger an anesthetic is, clinically, the stronger it likes to concentrate in the cell membrane. And the effect within the cell membrane, uh, in these rafts of, uh, made of ceramides and uh, combined with cholesterol, they're called rafts, they're like the waxy, harder fats, that are the portals in and out of the, of the cell, uh, through the cell membrane, for nutrition to come in or to close down the portal and say, no, there's something toxic out there. We make more cholesterol to, to shut it down and, and alter the ceramides inside the cell to regulate that and say, no, we, we need to detoxify. We need to break down what's here and eliminate stuff. Don't let any, any you know, close the gates. No more, nobody else comes in. Uh, so that anabolic, catabolic regulation of the cell, uh, but also with anesthetics, we see that, that the cell membrane, and particularly these rafts where the, where the tubules attach, uh, become incoherent. It's like our, our consciousness becomes in incoherent. There is no consciousness. We're, we're out, you know, we're, we're under anesthesia. Sens sensation is gone. There's no when, there's no uh, who, where, we're gone. And uh, so the, the, uh, they found with calculating the number of micro microtubules and the number of electrons that can be in state A or B or both or neither because of quantum superposition, the nature of, of, of physics when we study it at the, at the deepest level, the smallest level, it's, it's not all or none. It's, there's possibilities, there's potential, there's there's multiple possibilities. There's room for, for either or, and or. And uh, so, but beyond the orco r model that says that that memory must be there in the microtubules, I say, no, it's not, in, it's not in the brain when we're not in the brain. So those microtubules, though, are the perfect antenna to the consciousness, to the spirit body. And when the spirit minerals take up their place at the ends and perhaps probably in the middle of the tubule as well. There's evidence, uh, uh, there's even uh, research that was done by the Navy uh, that, that biological systems have this superconducting quality. This, the conductivity of those tubules, of the DNA, which is another seat of, of cellular consciousness where the cells respond epi epigenetically, they change the shape and antenna shape of the DNA the resonance, the function, according to the environment, the sensory environment of the cell. We have sensors on the cell membrane, like little antenna, that that's amplify and convert and send those signals to the DNA. So all this is happening in life, and no more at death. Fritz Popp, who studied, uh, Professor Popp in, in, in Europe, years and years of study of, of biophotons, those biophotons are coherent, they're laser-like. They, they communicate from the mitochondria, which are actually structured like lasers. They have these little chambers like lasers do, and they create this coherent light. And they communicate beyond within one cell, but the, from one cell to many cells around.
they create this field of communication, of coherent light that's able to send real signals and be re received with meaning uh, despite the background information of, of light, like the heat, the infrared energy. It's able to transcend that. Uh, so uh, what Fritz Popp found was that the, there's, there's way more of this biocommunication when there's change. When, when a child is growing and developing and changing their cells, when, when uh, so for, for generative changes and also for degenerative changes, when cells are, are aging and in, in an unhealthy way, when there's de degenerative disease, there's an increase in that biocommunication. And at the moment of death, there's a huge release of the, the photonic information, the coherent laser-like light that we don't yet know exactly how that, how that works to be maybe received by other cells uh, in a meaningful and useful way uh, when that one cell dies. But we do have that one study, the McDougall study, uh, 80, 100 years ago, that measured a change in mass at the moment of death. We also have, in, in 2004, uh, 2010, just five years ago, a study that confirmed that light, that photons themselves have mass when they are in a condensate state. So the photonic energy in the condensate spirit body, as well as the condensates themselves, the minerals that have four ninths of their normal mass, like the gold, gold element uh, mineral in your spirit body, is gonna weigh about four ninths of what a metallic gold in a ring would, would weigh. The element associated with the question uh, who, who am I? I am, I'm now, I'm here, experience now, as I experience being here. So that was metal and fire. And the who is also an identification of the fire element. This is the, would be the bottom of, of, the, of the heart chakra. So it's the, the space of gratitude when life is flowing of, you know, it's like to be thankful, just to be. And, uh, and the mind, the fourth question of why, trying to understand, is the earth element. I talked about the food and how we break the food down into bits and then we build it back up into, into these linear structures of DNA and proteins and how we do the same with, with our perceptions. We break them down into the, the the tasty bits of, oh, it's a chair, or it's a person, or that's a flower, and it's, that's green, that's red. The qualia of philosophy the, and, and of perception, the qualitative units of our perception, that's all the earth element. That's, that's how we digest the world and reform it into our thoughts, our, our knowledge, our experience. And uh, the next step from that is the water element. The water element is well, it's the kidneys and the bladder. And there's a sequence to all of these. We start with the lungs. I picture it being in the upper right quadrant of the chest. Why? Because the right lung is larger than the left lung. The left thorax, where the lungs are, and heart are located, the heart is all on the left side of the body. So it takes up space that's all lung tissue on the right. So we start with the metal element with the lung and colon, large intestine, is the pair, paired meridians there and associated with the senses. Then we go to the heart, associated with, again, the top of the chakra being letting go of attachment, of wanting, and so we can have, because if I'm wanting, I'm not having. If I'm having, I'm not wanting. So, and that tells us what direction the, the energy is moving. If it's moving in, to, uh, into us, if we're being fed, that's grace, that's joy, that's love and happiness. So that's a clue to our path, to being on the path. And when that energy now exits, if it's not blocked, there's gratitude. And that's where, that's where the seed of, of who, of I, who I am is. I'm this being who's in gratitude. I'm not the grace. I'm, I'm receiving it. It's coming into me. So I'm really in the center, but what flows out from me is this gratitude of being. Then we go to the earth element. 
Where is that? Earth element is the spleen and pancreas and stomach. They're all on the left side, not in the, not in the thoracic cavity. Now we're on the other side of it, below the, the diaphragm, we're in the abdominal cavity. And it's kind of upper, all upper left quadrant of the abdominal cavity. So there's our earth element. There's our, our thought, our consciousness. Well, this relates to the next chakra sphere out, which is the third and the fifth chakra. So we're at the top, and the, the energies come in the top and go out the bottom when we're flowing, when, we're, when our spaceship, when our, our rockets are firing, when we're, when we're in liftoff mode, when we're growing and developing in a positive way, when uh, our pineal is pointed upward. Did you know that, that on autopsy, the human pineal gland points up or down? So we can orient toward, toward the light, the light of truth, the light of consciousness. We can hide, we can orient away from that. And, and you know, shrink away from challenges, which is how we don't grow. And when we can face challenges, whether we beat those challenges doesn't matter. It's what we face that allows us to grow and develop our who we are and what we get to take with us. Okay, so the, the water element is about the will. It's also related to memory uh, and, and choice. So, and, and, and being able to let go of the, our own will, our, our individuated will, first we have to develop it. To, you can't let go of something that you don't have. So we have to develop as an individual, and then in maturity, we can let go of that individuated will and allow the greater control. There's the small control of the ego. I am in control. Yeah, sure. <laughs> we'll see how that works out. <laughs> you know, oops, <laughs> I didn't see that. Oh, I tripped over that. Oh, ouch, that hurts. That didn't work. But there's the, the greater control, and you've probably experienced it when you're in the flow, in the divine flow of the universe, being at service, being willing to serve not just this self, this biological body self, but, but identifying beyond that, because you are beyond that. Your senses are only truly sensing what's out there because that's you out there. You know, you close your eyes and it goes away. Lock your ears and you can't hear it. The question for, that I'm associating with the water element, and these aren't necessarily absolutely unique associations, but, but, but they work well. So you can look at it from every perspective. It's a fractal universe. There's truth, however you ask the question. But if we ask the, associate the question, what? It, the question is, we have to expand it a little to really understand what I'm, I'm saying. The question is, what should I do? <laughs> what should I change? What should I accept or what should I modify? What should, I, what should be my action? Because the water element is about flow, it's about action, it's about change. And it's about the will. It's about creating that change, it's about navigating. It's about choice. Shall I go right or left? So we have a choice to act or not to act, to take path A or path B. And then when we go to the wood element, which completes the, the, the cycle here, or nearly is ready, gets us ready to complete the cycle, where the, the Ouroboros, it's called, where the snake, the symbol of the snake biting its own tail, an ancient symbol in many cultures, uh, is this cycle of consciousness in, in this context. So the wood element is the liver and gallbladder, all in the upper right abdomen. We've completed the circle of the actual physical locations in the body, so there's a cycle of movement this way, it transforms into these vortices of the, of the chakras as we're coming out. So the, the water element was the third chakra, and now we're at the wood element, which is going to be the third eye chakra, the, the sixth chakra, and also the second chakra, which are in one sphere, the top and bottom vortex of that sphere, which all is energized starting from the heart. When it's centered on the heart, that gets all those energies flowing in coherence, in a coherent way with each other, working all together as a team, working simultaneously. So the, the wood element is where we begin, really begin our transcendence in a, in a big way, because it's about vision, about light, where we, you know, in the, in, the, in the water element, we hear, so there's some information transferred from a distance through sound waves, but that's limited. If you close your eyes, 90% of your world just went away. And how, how, much, how many things in our environment can we hear? How well can we identify them? How well can we, 
can we see, can we know where they're located in space and how they're moving in time. Uh, so, so we're visual beings and, and that wood element, that vision is really the beginning of what I see as the transcendent quality uh, where we see seeing is, is beyond the two-dimensional plane of choice of a, a or B where we can now see we have like a map that's three-dimensional we can see oh we can go to the right or left on this path but there's a mountain in the middle we could go up to the top of it and, and make a new map of the other side before we go there we have many choices we have the freedom to to not act sometimes we think you know under under stress adrenal activity we have to act we have the energy to act or am i going to run you know fight fright fight or flight are the choices when when the when the water element is is under stress uh, so the wood element when we're not stressed gives us the perspective the wisdom of having more choices including the wisdom of when seeing when to act but it's 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 how how shall i interact with this system shall i interact at all so maybe i should move away maybe uh, the when when the wood element is stressed we have anger and frustration so there's energy for for correction you know it's often thought of as a negative uh, negative emotional state and that's because we don't have proper guidance and proper models for how to implement the energy that we have when when there's damage and a situation of wrong of that needs correction that's what that wood element energy is for it's all about structure you know if the structure is broken how do we fix it we fix the frame of it with the wood element uh, so we have the the visual chakra the sixth chakra for spatial navigation and the second chakra is about the social navigation and together that that transcends from you know me seeing to actually seeing you to being able to have insight into your perspective to be able to relate to others in a social context you know family and tribe and then from there we go back to the original element the metal element for the the top and bottom chakras the, the truly transcendent of the divine connection the spirit and grounding that ultimately in our mission here on earth <laughs>